I propose then to address certain features of US news coverage of the Iraq War and the Afghanistan War, in particular the widespread failure to address the energy geopolitics of the matter. I then propose, much more briefly, to touch upon emergent dimensions of US military policy, including robotics. I will finally propose that these issues reveal how journalism and journalism education are in a state of crisis in the USA. The Iraq War. Often it is labeled Gulf War II, with the 1990-1991 Gulf War as number one. And the nomenclature itself is a kind of bellwether of the problem. What was actually the first Gulf War ran between 1980 and 1988 and cost around a million Iranian lives and between a quarter and a half a million Iraqi lives. The United States government sustained the Saddam side with satellite surveillance data and weapon sales. It backed the Saddam side to the point that when in 1987 an Iraqi Mirage jet exocetted the USS Stark in the Gulf, killing 37 US sailors, the Reagan administration hushed Congress and continued business as usual with the Iraqi regime. At the same time, of course, the uh, government within the government of Oliver North was conducting secret <coughs> sales of US weapons to the Iranian regime and using the proceeds, amongst other things, to buy weapons to arm the Nicaraguan Contras, who had been banned from public funding by Congress two or three years before. The nomenclature question raises at least two questions then. First, is a war, even an eight-year war, with perhaps one and a half billion deaths, and heaven knows how many Iraqis and Iranians maimed, not really a war unless the US is actually fighting in it? If 1991, 1990, 1991 is Gulf War I, was the 1888 war Gulf War Zero? Gone for nothing. <laughs> and secondly, what was the US administration doing hushing down the unprovoked deaths of 37 of its sailors and the huge damage to one of its warships sailing in international waters? Think of the difference in response to the USS Cole attack in Yemen. And thirdly, why was all this not a continuing co celebre in the US news media. Why was it, why were those sailors allowed just to die away? So this axiomatic use of nomenclature to number Gulf Wars pinpoints the continuing failure of US news media owners and editors to require their journalists to dig beyond the surface in the so-called Middle East. It pinpoints their readiness to be trustworthy and reliable regarding government foreign policy. It pinpoints how even very recent history becomes a black hole in the editorial mindset. If the 8088 war was a real Gulf War, what, it had been, what had it been about? Why had the US administration been involved in the ways it was? Did that not shed light of any kind on the Iraq war decision already made by the cabinet in spring 2002. If 8088 wasn't a real war, then of course all that didn't really matter. Now let me anticipate a cheap shot against my argument here. I'm not fantasizing that someone sat down and instructed masses of editors not to call 8088 a Gulf War. This was perfectly spontaneous. It derived from our national, culturally imbued, intuitive disinterest in the region, except as an oil spigot. And it derived from the delusive conviction of many of our best and brightest that US foreign policy automatically stands for honesty and justice and decency for the good guys against the bad guys. When Gulf War III was in preparation, there was indeed much debate in the US press as to whether it should be pursued. Editor and publisher ran a survey of press editorials on March 14, 2003. 
Avi Berman found that out of 50 top newspapers, slightly more than half took what he termed a dovish position. But in military terms, that position was founded on grievously misleading the US public about hard realities. A military operation of that size takes a year or more logistically to get underway. And as we know, this operation had no specific interest in a realistic post-invasion plan. So if that had been a concern too, the prior organizational and logistical issues would have been even more mountainous. The point being that once the military machine is up and rolling, it does not stop. And in this case, Cheney, Rumsfeld, and their cowed generals particularly wanted to get troops into Iraq before the Iraqi summer started and in time to be fully ensconced before the run-up to the 2004 election. Enter Secretary of State Powell at the UN, the person everyone in the US political class, frightened by Cheney and Rumsfeld, had nominated as their voice of reason in the cabinet. A dizzying capitulation followed. One sole senator voted against out of 100 of our finest. And the whole question in the editorials pivoted on one single simple thing, whether we were at risk or not. If oil was mentioned, it was at the time generally in connection with whether Saddam Hussein would set light to the oil fields again or what had happened to the oil for food program. There was practically never an overview available, certainly no overview was persistently available, of the ongoing energy geopolitics of the region since the 1940s, not just Iraq. The anti-war movement reiterated no blood for oil, but even that implied that oil was a faucet we could just decide one morning to switch off which in global economic terms is beyond absurd. What our news media rarely engaged with is the medium-term scenario in the global economy, in other words, over the next 20 years. This means not simply focusing on Iraq, but engaging both with the region as a whole and with anticipated global demand for oil and also for natural gas. Iraq, people don't usually know, is also the possessor of known reserves of at least 82 trillion standard cubic feet of natural gas. And in terms of accurately disclosed and easily accessible reserves, and both those qualifiers are important, Iraq is the second or third largest source of global oil deposits. But that is only one part of the story. So too is only one part of the story that the USA uses at present 25% of global oil production, importing over half of it, and that it taxes oil at 40% as opposed to the average level of 65% in comparable economies. In other words, the US public expects cheap gasoline, both at the pump and as a cost factor in most everything else. Nationally, we are all on welfare to see the Middle East. There are wider dynamics still. They include the political instability of the Saudi Kingdom, the widespread unpopularity of the other Gulf sheikdoms, Iran's continuing ambition to function as a regional power, the rise of Kazakhstan as a huge oil and gas producer, the ongoing turbulence in Nigeria's oil fields, the assertiveness of the Chavez administration in Venezuela, the determination of Russia to function as an oil and gas superpower, China's and India's rapidly increasing demand for oil, the US regime's perception of China as its global challenger for the incoming century, and the radical interdependence of the advanced economies, every single one of them up to their eyebrows in oil dependency. In other words, the global system is riven with conflict and competition. Yet it is one in which at present there is a single supercop with around 700 overseas military bases.
the logic of this total scenario, I am arguing, virtually required the US regime to seize the golden opportunities presented by 9-11 and the monstrous Saddam dictatorship to position itself physically in those two countries in the region, at hand to bolster the Saudi regime, at hand to interfere with the Iranian regime, and next to the partly loyal, partly hostile Pakistani regime, the two fillings in a double-decker sandwich. It was never a question of establishing direct colonial rule in Iraq or Afghanistan, rather of establishing military bases right in the heart of the region to function for one or more decades. Their presence can, can continually be justified in order to contain never-ending unrest and turbulence among supposedly barbaric and bloodthirsty peoples. Their presence can be requested by compliant local governments or at least by major political parties, even if out of government. The US has publicly reiterated that these bases will, be, uh, will not be permanent, but has offered neither a time limit on access to Iraqi bases, nor any restrictions on the US, quote, to conduct military operations in Iraq and to detain individuals when necessary for imperative reasons of security. Now this deceptive language regarding Iraq's US military bases held, holds precedence in both the Philippines and Vietnam. Meanwhile, news reporting has overwhelmingly focused on the particular twists and turns of the fighting, the trees instead of the wood. It certainly does not focus in Afghanistan on the additional fact that our and Europe's effective consumer demand for heroin is the one thing that can immediately improve the life chances of millions of desperately poor Afghan villagers' children. But instead of focusing intelligently on our own internal problems, we have NATO destroy the poppy crop and send out predator drones piloted from Nevada <coughs> over areas where their immaculate technology enables them unerringly to distinguish the guilty from the innocent. Let me turn finally to my two last points, emerging war, US war policy, and the current problems of journalism and journalism education in the USA. Last Sunday's New York Sunday Times carried an article on how the Obama administration is busy developing plans that will enable the USA to fight not just two wars simultaneously, but many. We know that the Obama administration is heavily stocked with folk like Samantha Power, who are convinced that the USA is capable of using, and should use, its capacity for massive military violence in order to make the world a better place. I do not doubt Ms. Powers or her colleagues' sincerity. But in the light of imperial history over the last two centuries at least, I cannot escape, and we should not let ourselves escape, from awareness of episodes such as the British Navy shelling and then seizing Lagos port in 1851 in order to suppress its merchants' continued involvement in the slave trade. That, of course, was the first step in the annexation of all of what is now Nigeria which initially brought vast quantities of palm oil to lubricate Britain's industrial machines, and then, from 1937 onwards, brought untold wealth to Shell and British, Petro British Petroleum. Similarly, the US confrontation with Japan in the 1930s over its merciless annexation of China was the right thing to do, but it was at least equally dictated by the US regime's determination not to lose China for itself. NATO announced its 1999 bombing of Serbia and Kosovo as its new post-Cold War 50th Jubilee humanitarian mission to block genocide. Although the Kosovo Liberation Army, trained by US private military contractors, had killed more people prior to the bombing than had Serb forces. 
Back of the enthusiasm for being able to fight lots of wars at once is, of course, the conviction that this is feasible. Now, in view of the current near exhaustion of US troops, it seems completely out of touch with reality. In terms of the lessons we learned from losing in Vietnam, our refusal to tolerate massive continuing casualties in service of a war that they la launch on our behalf also obstructs this giddy drive to lots of wars. But, hey presto, enter the technological fix, robots. Air, land, and sea. No busted robot has a mother or father to write a letter of condolence to. No robot gets disillusioned, dispirited, or scared in battle. No robot wonders whether it might be shooting at an innocent civilian. Cute little R2-D2s, the Mark bots, can detonate IEDs. Drones can see in a technology human interface running from Fallujah to Nevada and back again to Fallujah on the ground or on an Afghan mountain pass. This form of surveillance together with telecommunications and internet surveillance is currently the latest spike in what the late Michael Kidron and others have termed our military Keynesian economy. The term means that the government fees vast tax dollars to military supply firms and military R&D firms, many of them super high tech. Rather than classical Keynesianism, which tries to put money in consumers' pockets so they have effective demand, military Keynesianism channels national tax revenues into leading industrial sectors that supply the military. This sustains our economic stability by putting money into the hands of those firms' employees and continuously prods our global competitive advantage in high tech. The huge new benefactor for the last decade has been and will continue to be the surveillance industry, global and national. Indeed, there really is no global and national in this sphere. Los Angeles is buying some predator drones to police certain neighborhoods. Most African and Latin American phone and internet traffic actually routes physically through the United States. AT&T's major routing point for NSA surveillance of global telecommunications and internet traffic is located in Bridgeton, Missouri, immediately northwest of St. Louis Airport. Some of the thugs obeying Rumsfeld's orders in Abu Ghraib were former prison guards in the USA. Geographer Trevor Paglin's very recent book, Black Spots on the Map, investigates a network of US secret sites, once again fusing the national and the global, from Alamogordo to Las Vegas to Tegucigalpa to Kabul. One zone in Nevada is blocked to civilian telecommunications over an area the size of Switzerland. Groom Lake in the middle of it so does not exist that the widow of a worker killed by toxic substances in his work there was told by a US government representative that her husband had never existed because the site did not exist. So Guantanamo, rendition sites and airports, communication, secrecy and lawlessness overseas and right here at home are all in the same stew. Now, there are many implications in this emerging robot process in particular, but I'll comment on just one. Ever since bombing civilians from a safe place became predominant in warfare, Guernica in 1937 being an iconic case, the bombers' countries have celebrated the strategy as a way of teaching a decisive lesson to the enemy without risking losses oneself. Carpet bombing of Hamburg, Dresden, Tokyo, then the A-bomb, predator drones are only the latest version of the same philosophy, combining nicely with the ban on photos of the turning caskets at Dover Air Force Base. But the question is, will this strategy, currently in the process of blowing Pakistani and Afghan villages to smithereens, not alienate the world from the USA even further, May it not give a very green light indeed to those who would recruit suicide bombers to strike at our civilians. 
Is this issue ever systematically ventilated in our news media? Is the energy geopolitics issue systematically ventilated? Why is it that the war rationale and the deception regarding weapons of mass destruction and rendition and torture, why is it that all this had to be addressed by Michael Massing and Mark Danner in tiny publications like the New York Review of Books? Is this not a crisis of non-fulfillment? Oh, dear. Uh, <laughs> non-fulfillment of news outlets, owners, and editors' responsibilities. I feel terrible. I have a they, <laughs> in journalism education, and this really is the end, a study I did a couple of years back of the curriculum in eight leading public and eight leading private universities in the USA found some very unpalatable truths. Curricular focus on international journalism issues was really quite rare. Medill, USC, Missouri, Ohio State, NYU, Minnesota, Columbia have few or no courses available in international journalism. My study of a number of standard subjects, uh, standard textbooks in journalism or communication found a very similar picture. I concluded that study, some of the most prestigious and or largest universities are central actors in the continuing construction of this unnerving deficit. It is a deficit which plausibly has immense implications for the readiness of many university-educated US citizens, cultural leaders in our communities, <clears throat> to endorse or at least tolerate the long succession of foreign wars in which US administrations have engaged directly or by proxy, as in the very first Gulf War. Now, that is a crisis in journalism and communication education. Thank you.